Welcome to the mitral valve workshop for Boston Structural Heart course. Today we'll discuss the echocardiographic assessment of suitability for repair in the operating room. While there are numerous comprehensive reviews about the structure and function of mitral valve, there are very few or none at all that assess the workflow of an intraoperative examination of putting together all the information and the components of the intraoperative examination into a methodical algorithmic approach to verbalize a formal recommendation regarding the suitability of repair. So this is what we've done in this examination to put together all that information in a methodical fashion so that you can have a consistent and a uniform approach to the intraoperative assessment for suitability for repair. So what follows is only a preview and a small component of this workshop that assesses the suitability of repair. Hope you enjoy it. In order to optimize surgical results, it's important to follow a uniform and consistent algorithmic approach to the intraoperative transesophageal echocardiographic examination of the mitral valve. Now the road that leads from your first looks to making a final recommendation regarding the suitability for repair is a windy and a treacherous one. The numerous potholes and traps regarding the quantification of MR the identification of the mechanism, exclusion of stenosis and likelihood of dynamic alveoli obstruction. And if you do not follow an algorithmic approach, it's quite possible that you may feel lost, confused, unsure, and perplexed. Considering these nuances of the mitral valve examination in an editorial, in the Journal of Heart and Valve Disease in 2003, Dr. Shah analogized the transesophageal echocardiography, providing a roadmap of mitral valve anatomy to the surgeons to add an element of precision to their repair. This assessment was further improved by Dr. Carlos Duran in 2006 in another editorial that transesophageal echocardiography actually provides a roadmap for mitral valve repair and actually pre-planning the surgery before the surgery. And they said that without transesophageal echocardiography, it's analogous to getting lost in a large city with a lot of roads and transesophageal echocardiography provides a roadmap to go from destination A to destination B. In my opinion, if trans two-dimensional echocardiography is a road atlas, three-dimensional transesophageal echocardiography is a GPS location system that adds an element of absolute precision in the identification of mechanism and the pre-planning phase of cardiac surgery for mitral valve repair. We may not get the actual credit but the perioperative transesophageal echocardiography has been the major focus and the major reason that the mitral valve surgery has evolved so much. And the history of mitral valve surgery and its development has to involve the incorporation of transesophageal echocardiography in that information. And because of all these technological innovations, transesophageal echocardiography, which started only as a monitoring modality, has become a very vital procedural adjunct during mitral valve repair surgery. And that's because, as a result of this physiological appreciation of anatomy in real time, we have come to realize that mitral valve is not just the leaflets, but part of an apparatus that consists of the left atrium, the annulus, the leaflets, corded tendine, papillary muscles, being the anatomical part of the mitral valve apparatus, and their function in the milieu of preload, afterload, and rate and rhythm and contractility which is the physiological component of the mitral valve apparatus. And as a result of generation of left atrial on fast views of the mitral valve, now we can speak the same language as the surgeons and we can communicate across specialties much better and our recommendation and our identification of anatomical dysfunction can be more precise and in, and in terminology that is understandable to our surgical colleagues also. For example, while it is still considered the gold standard, that is the on-pump examination of the mitral valve, that is a leak test being performed on a flaccid and a paralyzed heart, and the same valve being seen with real-time live three-dimensional echocardiography demonstrating the true nature of this flail leaflet, which is so obvious when it is exposed to the preload, afterload, rate rhythm, and contractility. And therefore, we may not get the recognition, or we may not be recognized, but I think that the pre-bypass three-dimensional examination of the mitral valve forms the gold standard for planning the type of surgery that the patient is going to have, even when it is not formally recognized like that. 
Therefore, my method that I follow in the operating room is quite consistent and algorithmic that starts with exclusion of contraindications, diagnosis and quantification of dysfunction, identifying the mechanism, then diagnosing the pathophysiology and quantification of the valve with 2D and three-dimensional echocardiography, exclusion of the predictors of repair failure, SAM predictors, and finally, the complicated aspect of functional mitral regurgitation and post-repair assessment of the mitral valve. So therefore, before you start, always exclude contraindications. That is step one. It is quite possible to get so far ahead into the examination and then finally finding out that the patient has significant stenosis or active infection, severe mitral annular calcification, severe mitral annular dilation. These are all indicators indicators and exclusionary criteria for performing a mitral valve repair operation. So step one, after having excluded contraindication, is a qualitative assessment of knowing that is there any dysfunction? Does the patient have significant mitral regurgitation? Because dysfunction is synonymous with mitral regurgitation. Therefore, quantification of dysfunction is quantification of the severity of mitral regurgitation. So step one, confirm the presence of MR. And what we use in the operating room are semi-quantitative or quantitative methods. I am hugely biased against using the proximal isovelocity surface area method because there are many more mathematical assumptions built into it with increasing the chance of error. Therefore, just being more complicated does not necessarily make it very, ac very accurate. Therefore, we consistently follow the vena contractor method of assessment of severity of MR because it is simple, it is quick, and not as affected by loading conditions as our other methods of quantification of mitral regurgitation. So to recap what we have learned so far, step one of this algorithmic examination to, is to diagnose the presence of MR, and step two is to quantify mitral regurgitation. Step three is to identify the mechanism of MR. We follow the Carpentier classification of type one, that is normal function, type two, that is excessive motion, and type three A and B, that is restricted motion, either because of ischemia or because of rheumatic restriction of the leaflets. For example, type 1 dysfunction, you can see a mitral valve perforation because of an infective endocarditis with absolute normal motion of the leaflets. Type 2 dysfunction can be a little bit more complicated. It can be because of billowing leaflets with the coaptation point staying in the plane of the annulus or prolapse when the coaptation point goes beyond the plane of the annulus into the left atrium and finally flail which in implies torn cordy when the undersurface of the leaflet is exposed to the left atrium. Surgically, it is important to differentiate between flail and prolapse and the underlying pathophysiology that is fibroelastic deficiency that involves isolated P2, P1 flail or Barlow's valve which involves multiple scallops and bileaflet involvement in dilated NLI and lengthened leaflets. Finally, the type 3 mechanism which is leaflet tethering and mitral regurgitation is an important component of assessment for suitability of repair when the patient has functional ischemic mitral regurgitation, and that brings into the quantification, which we shall discuss later. So recap, step one is to identify the presence of MR, that is diagnosed dysfunction. Step two is quantification of MR, that is quantification of dysfunction. And step three is mechanism of MR that tells you why this dysfunction is happening. After having the, these steps checked out, the next step would be to go on to quantify the structural components of the mitral valve. Well, we are very thorough in doing this thing and employ both two-dimensional and three-dimensional imaging techniques involving multiplanar reformatting to exactly quantify the annular diameters, the leaflet lengths, the CSEP distances, and, and the areas and the uh, uh, dimension of the mitral annulus, particularly so in the anteroposterior axis, are provided to our surgical colleagues at this stage. And then we can get into the more complicated uh, assessment of mitral annulus and leaflets when if the patient has significant functional or ischemic mitral regurgitation to go over the non planarity angle and the leaflet angles, which are beyond the scope of this presentation but are part of the actual mitral valve workshop when you go through that. And finally, we exclude the possibility of dynamic left ventricular output tract obstruction because as a result of repair, 
there's significant anterior displacement of the coaptation point, and with a long anterior leaflet, there's a likelihood of dynamic LVOT obstruction and significant MR, which is one of the commonest reasons for repair, immediate repair failure. And for that, we perform the ALPL ratio, the length of the anterior leaflet, the length of the posterior leaflet, and finally the CSEP distance. So at this stage of the examination, we are ready to give a recommendation in this sense. For example, for a patient with flail leaflet, you could be verbalized as the patient has no contraindications to repair, the patient has severe MR as a result of type 2 dysfunction because of fibroelastic deficiency, then provide the quantification of the AP diameter of the annulus, the length of the leaflets, the anterior leaflet to posterior leaflet ratio, c set distance, and the likely or the unlikelihood of having dynamic LVOT obstruction, and make your recommendation. We have also published this review in a much more detailed and comprehensive fashion as an expert review in the Journal of Cardiothoracic and Vascular Anesthesia this year. Take a look at it also. But this is also a part of our mitral valve workshop. This was just a snapshot and a sneak peek. Please stay tuned for the online launch of the Boston Structural Heart Course. Thank you and have a good time.